Good morning. <laughs> All right, we are on Revelation part three, lesson six. So we're really, this is our middle point of this part three. Can you believe it? We're already halfway through, which is awesome. Um, I, we do have one new student, uh, Dan B, and she's joining us. She's out of state, so she's not local. But for, for her benefit, I do want to go back. And also, it gives me an excuse to get to go back and review some of the basic fundamentals of what we have learned so far concerning how we handle God's word on the whole, right? specifically how are we handling the book of revelation so for uh denby's sake particularly i want to go through uh the segment divisions for the book of revelation one more time to refresh your memory we're kind of out of revelation almost i mean we did drop into it on day five right supposedly we should have been there if you made it to day five right i hope you did um but um Revelation needs to be, I think, the key to opening up Revelation for being able to interpret it really well and understand it is really falling back on these segment divisions, understanding the literary flow and how God has mapped out a very orderly, a very systematic uh, unfolding of this plan. God never intended for it to be a big mystery to us. He didn't. He wants us to understand it. Uh, um, Kristen was just saying this morning, you know, she sometimes she overthinks it, right? I think we all do. You know, we get sometimes the other thing is we get tunnel vision. We look at one verse and one statement. We forget to bring in all the other things that we already know. And we're trying to make sense of this one that sounds like it's out of whack. We, and, and generally we have the problem when we also don't uh, recall what, what the literary work is that we are in. This week we've been in, in Matthew, we've been in parables, right? M majority of it has been parables, uh, but, but it vacillates back and forth between parables and, and literal unfolding of what's going to happen. The events of the, of the coming of the Lord and um, how we can know when that is, what are the signs and when will it happen? So let's go back and look at our segment divisions because these are important. Did Denby get these segment divisions? Um, don't know. Okay, we need to send her. Okay, Denby, we will send this to you so that you'll have these segment divisions um, on paper and that will help you a great deal. I recommend all of you, whenever you are working. Um, oh, yes, she should have gotten this because you sent out a new version when you added the portion. Okay, excellent in part three okay she says you have it uh, so go in you do okay she, she's shaking her head i think that means yes i have it okay <laughs> that's all i can see is this <laughs> okay so the outline of the book this is the literary flow first of all god himself gave us the outline in chapter 1 verse 19 right there were three three segments for this book the way it divides itself up the first one is chapter one what john saw the second one is chapters two and three, the things which are, which is the church age. And then chapters four to 22, which are the things which shall take place after these things, right? So they're future. That's the first major segment division. And God gives that to us super clear. The other one that God gives to us that's not as easily found, but you can't, once it's pointed out to you, it's, it's clear as mud, right? I mean, it's, it's very simple, mud. Um, <laughs> mud's not clear right <laughs> you know what i mean it was a joke okay and that okay so the other segment division is in the spirit in the spirit is said four times in the book of revelation um and i know the first couple of times i went through doing revelation i didn't catch that that was actually a segment division i just saw it as a statement and i was trying to wrap all my thoughts on it around just the, its immediate context and what was said right there right but a after i had begun to do more segment division work i realized that i put these in the spirit segment divisions out and i could see that they actually had a pattern to them and the pattern is this the pattern is the first in the in the spirit is in chapter 1 verse 10 and it gives you detail 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 this is something god does often in he as he's um giving us history or giving us a record of things we see it in genesis also we see where he gives details and then big picture right or in the case of genesis it's big picture and then details 
Revelation, he starts with details. He tells us about the church, how he wants it to come to faith, how he wants them to repent, how they're to walk. And then he names specifically the sins that have been going on. So that's details. Then the next segment uh, doesn't come until chapter four, verse two. So that means chapter one, verse one, all the way to four, chapter four is your first segment for in the spirit. Your next in the spirit begins in chapter four and runs all the way to chapter, uh, the end of chapter 16, because the next in the spirit is going to be 17, three. So you have in the spirit details, in the spirit, big picture, then starting in 17, three details again. And those details are about the wrath of God, how he's warning believers, what's going to happen there. Then the last one is a big picture, which is in the spirit. And it's all about the new heaven and the new earth, right? It's that big picture about God's reward, the promises to the overcomer, which he started the whole book back in chapter one about, you know, uh, if you will do these things, right? Don't leave your first love and um, hold fast and endure in suffering and all those things. And then there are these rewards. Well, the rewards are given to us in a very broad spectrum in the last in the spirit statement, which is in, in 2110. So that covers chapter 21 and 22. So details, big picture, details, big picture. It's a pattern. It's logical. It's orderly. That's God. And it just makes such sense once you see it. Okay. So that's the second major specific, uh, what I would call a segment division. Then we have some others which have to do with the literary flow. And I'm putting them on my segment division chart because it's, it's the logical place to put them for us to be able to reference them, right? The, the first uh, one I, ca I call uh, parentheses, pause or uh, pause seg segments. There are th three portions of the unfolding of revelation starting in chapter four all the way to 22 where this happens the first one is chapter seven you're you're moving along you're in the the seals and all of a sudden at the end of chapter six verse 17 he poses a question about all the things that we have seen at up to that point and he says who can stand right well chapter seven is a pause and in that he answers that question okay then chapter 10 does something similar in it you're moving along you're getting towards the middle of the sixth trumpet all of a sudden he pauses to give a warning it's it's like a it's like a person your passenger seat person who says to you you have to turn at the next corner he's letting you know what's coming ahead so in this one he makes this announcement and the announcement is in the seventh trumpet the mystery of god is finished it's it's only for the purpose of drawing your attention to the fact that there is something profoundly uh, significant about that seventh trumpet when it occurs. Then he tells us what the pro profoundness of it is. In the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is finished. Now, we'll talk about that for five seconds because what, what do you think that exactly works out to now that we've been in this for so long? How do you see the seventh trumpet being the mystery of God is finished? The trumpet sounds, what happens in that seventh trumpet? What appears? Huh? I'm asking you about the trumpet itself. In the seventh trumpet, because he says, in the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is finished. What pre what's presented in the seventh trumpet? No. No. What happens in the seventh trumpet? Chapter 11, I think, begins it. It starts at... It, yeah, you guys have forgotten. See, it was good. We thank you. Well, it happens. Yes, but what I want you to what I'm what here. I'll just tell you what I'm. Thank you, Carol. Yay, Carol got it. The bulls are presented. Remember, because because this is one of the the ways we know the pattern of even all of the unfolding of the seals, the trumpets and the bowls is that you can't get to the trumpets until the seals are finished. Why not? Because when the last seal is uh, open, the seventh seal presents what? Seven angels with seven trumpets. The trumpets are given to them at that point. What happens when the seventh trumpet sounds? Seven angels appear and 
out of the temple, they come and they hand them bowls. They don't even have the bowls until the seventh seal uh, trumpet is blown, right? So you can't even move to your next trumpets until you have finished all, you can't move to your, your bowls until you have finished your trumpets. So it shows you how there's this sequential order that one cannot come before the other, that you have to have the, the sounding of that seventh trumpet uh, in order to move to the, the bowls, right? You can't begin the bowls until the trumpet sounds because they don't even have the bowls yet, right? They're still in the temple in this vision. And then what he says is, then in the seventh trumpet, well, seven angels come out, they, they're holding their bowls, and it says, in the seventh trumpet, the mystery is finished. What does that mean visually? What are you seeing? There they are, they're standing before you, they're holding the bowls. If you could look inside each of those bowls, if you were standing right there as John was in the vision, what is he seeing? He's seeing each one of these bowls. He knows what they are, he, do you, right? The wrath of God. And he knows what's in each one of those wraths and, and what, what they're gonna, then, he, then it goes sequentially, First bowl poured out, second in chapter 16, he, he, uh, he pours them out. So this second uh, parentheses, which is chapter 10, is these seven angels are given their seven bowls. And in it says, and in the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God is finished. Why? Because now they're, now they're declared. Now they're open to see. Now they're, they're right there before his eyes. It's no longer, gee, I wonder what that's going to be about which is where, you know, you and I would be if God hadn't given it to us, right? But, but before, before this vision was given to John, did Israel as a nation know that there was going to be a time of great wrath? Yes, but did they know this? It was a mystery, right? This, is, this was a mystery until John, it was revealed to John in this vision. So that's what that chapter 10 parentheses is about is revealing the mystery at that point and that and it's significant it's profound and it's unique and we also know the uniqueness just because of all the other studying we've done about you know the witnesses going up satan coming down the woman fleeing all these things begin to happen at that moment but that's because now the mystery is finished right Okay, the last parenthesis is a really big one. It starts chapter 12, verse one, it goes all the way to 15, four. We call it the three signs, which is what it is. It, it opens the very first chapter in 12, one, it talks about, and I saw a sign and it was a woman. And then I saw another sign and it was a dragon, right? Then there's all kinds of people and, and characters on the stage that are explained as we go on. We see the antichrist, the false prophet. We see... Um, uh, the uh, the reapers, we see the reaping of the earth, that we see the evangelism and the reaping of the earth. And then the very last one comes just in 15.4. And it's the one of, again, what I just said, the seven angels standing there with the seven bowls. That's the third sign, okay? We call this sign parentheses. It's the purpose of it like the other two had a purpose. One was to answer a question. The other one was to make a big announcement about the seventh trumpet. This one, this parentheses, is to explain characters to us, to give us the backstories, the relationships, their identifying marks and characteristics, what events are going to be happening, how they play with one another. And in that, in that parentheses, you're going to find that sometimes there's backstories that have nothing to do with the timeline of the immediate unfolding of seals, trumpets, and bowls. And it can be confusing if you don't understand. This is a parenthesis. It's a drop-in piece of information that, that is giving you understanding of what are the dynamics going on with these people, right? Okay, so those were your three, three major parentheses segments in the, in the book on the whole. There are also the three woes. We just want to make note of those. Um, at the close of of uh, the fourth trumpet, he says there are four woes to come. It says, whoa, 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 because of the remaining three blasts. So what does that mean? Yep, the remaining three trumpets and each of those trumpets then, if, they, if they're each a woe, there's a woe. Well, what's interesting is in chapter, uh, in the fifth trumpet in chapter nine, 12, it says, and the first woe is past. As, as you get to the end of reading about that, uh, 
that first woe, which is the fifth trumpet, it tells you it's the first woe. Now, why is uh, cardinal numbers important for us to understand? What have we learned about cardinal first, second, third, fourth, fifth? Right, it gives order, it locks it in. It is first, it is second, it is third, it is fourth. You can't, you can't mix them up. So the first woe is the fifth trumpet. The second woe is the, se uh, is the sixth. And the third woe is the seventh. All right. So the other thing that happens for us then when we get to the third woe, it never has that conclusion statement like the other two. Now the third woe is passed. It doesn't do that. But what it does do is it gives us a, a, a couple of trigger statements in that parentheses segment about the devil that when he's thrown down woe to the earth there's your connection that it that that seventh trumpet connects to when the sat when satan is thrown down so when is he thrown down in the seventh trumpet so he's the, the sixth trumpet the two witnesses have gone up Satan comes down. Now you've got it locked in order. You know exactly where you're at. You know it's sequential. It's first, second, third, fourth. Um, and you know that these are the three woes. And now we're done with, with that segment. The last thing, as far as literary is concerned, that I think is really super helpful when you are trying to interpret the book of Revelation in, these, in chapter 4 to 22 is these mentions of the, the, what we call doxologies, there's quite a, quite a bit of actually writing on this if you go and look for it, but there's worship statements, right? What do you do with worship statements as far as interpreting its information for timelining? Can you take the worship statement where it is on the placement when it comes up in the passage and plug it all right in in that spot? No, why not? Yeah. It's not about the order. They're just worshiping God. Exactly. They're worshiping God. You know, you're not healed yet, but thank you, Lord, that you healed me. Okay. That's a perfect example. So I want to read this one. 11, chapter 11. This is the beginning of the seventh trumpet. When he said this very important thing is going to happen, this significant thing, he says, the seventh angel sounded. There were loud voices in heaven. Now you know you're in the heavenly realm. And, the, and it, in ver, at the end of verse 16, it says they worshiped God. So now you know you're in worship, right? And in there, he says, in that statement, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He will reign forever. The 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. Now that is basically verbatim what you see back in chapter uh, four and five when you're in the throne room of God, right? So again, you're before God in this worship. And he says, we give you thanks, duh, worship, right? Oh, Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Now, if you don't understand how to handle a worship moment in the writing of this, you could very easily say, oh, well, he's beginning to reign then in the seventh trumpet, right? And when it's speaking about this reigning, it's speaking about a literal kingdom reign on the earth because that's the context of this book. This is not talking about God reigns in a heart. Of course he does, right? The kingdom of earth has come upon us, even Matthew, or in uh, the, I think it was in the book of Matthew, but Jesus speaks about that. The kingdom of the world has come, but there are two kinds of kingdoms you have to decipher between. The book of Revelation is speaking about his coming physical, literal kingdom. It's not talking about the spiritual kingdom of the heart, okay? And it's not talking about the sovereignty of God, that he's king and he rules. It's talking about Jesus coming on this earth, setting up a kingdom and ruling. So you have to make sure you understand that when it makes the statement that the kingdom of our Lord and of this Christ, he will reign forever and ever. This is speaking of Jesus coming. You cannot take chapter 11, verse 15 to 18, and take that and place that at the seventh trumpet because it's worship. It's making a truth statement, a statement of fact. Okay, so that's how you handle worship. You're going to see several worships throughout uh, the passages. I listed several of them that I found 
in chapter four and five, of course, and this one in 11, but then there's in 15 and in 16 and in 19, there might be some others that, that are more subtle I missed, but um, it's just important that you catch it when there's worship. You don't want to think that you can drop it in right there. You have to know that that's just a statement of it's a declaration. Thank you, Lord, that you have, even though maybe he hasn't. For one thing, it goes on later to say that he's judged the dead. He's given the rewards to the saints. Well, hadn't done any of that yet either in the seventh trumpet, right? So we know it doesn't go right there at the seventh trumpet. All right. So that's kind of my 101 teaching this morning for, for that thing there. Now. I have one more to give you. You know how I love to teach inductive processes. I have to do this though, because students do not learn unless you do repetition. And I don't care how many times I say it, they, sometimes they don't get it until the hundredth time. Um, how to study your Bible. Uh, uh, Dendi, do you have this particular book? Yes, good. Okay, because this, this one's huge for everything. And I use this every single time we do a study. So you want to definitely have that. Okay, what I want to do is go through and talk to you about the subject of parables. How do you handle literary, par in, in the literary form, parables? Because we've dropped into Matthew, uh, we've done uh, 13, 24, and 25, right? Then we also did 2 Thessalonians last week, which was not a parable, it's, it's a letter. But since we've done so much in the parables, I think it's important to do a couple of things for us. We also have not done the book of Matthew in this group. I have done it though, thank goodness for that, because it saved my life and saved me a lot of hours of pulling my hair out and crying. Um, but I want to kind of set, set the, the understanding of these parables and how you're to handle them and understand that when you drop in to Matthew, just like with Revelation, there are segment divisions, right? And there's an author's purpose in that book. And you have to figure out what is his purpose in this book? And what segment division am I in when I drop into Matthew 13? What segment am I in when I drop into chapter 24 and 25? Because it's going to help you to interpret what you're looking at. Are you understanding what I'm saying on that? Okay. So... Let's see, let me do it this way. Um, here it is, wrong book. I got too many books. <laughs> okay, so Matthew, I have my, my at a glance chart that we did for the book of Matthew. I'm not gonna, I think we did send this out, didn't we? Oh, okay. I gave it to you last week on the charts. If you want to go look at last week's lesson four teaching chart, you have it. Like okay. Thank you. Lesson four. Boy, you're so good, Christy. Lesson four has th this particular chart in a mini form. It's not fully developed, but it's it's got the basics. So if you want to go back and look at that. But on the whole, what Matthew is about is is proving to Israel that Jesus is their king. Pretty much everybody out that's been around Christendom know, knows that, right? But what's really interesting is when we were going through that book, doing our homework on it, it was really tough to figure out segment divisions until it dawned on me that if that's his job is to prove that he's king, how is he going about that? Once I started asking myself the right question, I began to see that it, there were segments, passages that covered each of the steps that he wanted to, to use to accomplish the evidences and the proof that he was their king. Um, and what is really great about that is it makes Matthew, instead of a whole bunch of jumbled up stories and he does this and he spoke to them and he went here and he went there. And all of a sudden it becomes cohesive again and orderly, which is just like Revelation, there's order in it. It makes such sense once you figure it out. So Matthew does that. Now we've been in chapter uh, 13 and then uh, through 20. So let me, we are looking at 11. That segment division is chapter 11 to 13. You might want to make a note on your piece of paper, just so you know that the, the segment you're in when you did uh, Matthew 13 is that you're in the king's warning. Do not reject your king. So he's previously given you all the reasons why he is the king how he's demonstrated that in his ministry up to that point. And now he's giving them a stern warning, don't reject. Why do you think he said that at that point? 
what do you think they were doing at that point? <laughs> they were starting, they were, they, were, they were revving up the engines and really pushing back against Jesus' claim that he was the Christ. He was their promised king. Okay, so that's 11 to 13. Then when you get to um, 19 to 25 is the, the next segment that we dropped into. We, we missed a couple. We skipped a couple other segments. But the last one is the king comes soon. And when he comes, guess what he does? He judges. He makes judgment on who will enter into his kingdom. And so he's warning them, look, when I come, there will be a judgment. And guess what? What do you think that says to the Jews on the whole who think they're God's all, they're just, they're, they're so special and they're God's people. And so when he's standing there before them saying, I am your king. And when I come, I'm going to judge. I'm going to judge who will enter my kingdom. What do you think that tells them? There you go. You don't get in just because of your lineage, your heritage, just because you're a Jew does not get you into my kingdom. That's exactly what that does. Very good. Now, you know those two pieces of the puzzle of the literary flow. That's important. Now we go on to talking about parables just briefly. Most of you know all this, but um, parables are, are, they're basically similes and metaphors that are expounded. You know, instead of it just being a short quip, it, it expounds it, and it, sometimes the stories are quite lengthy, and some are, are shorter, but they basically make one major point. That is their purpose. Now, what we saw this week in a couple of the ones that we did is there's almost a long list. Jesus is this, the seed is that, the, you know, he gave a long list of, you know, so what's the point, right? Well, you have to evaluate what you're looking at and determine what, what do you think he was shooting for? What was his, his, what was he addressing and what was he trying to ultimately tell them? right? And once you understand that's how you handle a parable, instead of flittering all over the place and coming up with a hundred application points, which is what we tend to do in other kinds of studies, you will, for the purpose of inductive study, you'll go, there has to be one major point. He has to be trying to get them to understand a certain message, and he's using the parable as a way of demonstrating it to them, making it, remember we used to call it a heavenly story with an earthly meaning, right? So because he takes the spiritual realm and, and brings it down into our everyday living, he makes it applicable to us or understandable to us. So major, it makes one major point on the whole. There can be some other minor points in there that you can see, but remember, look for the major one because that's what you really want to focus on. The other one, other thing to know about parables is every one of them are about the gospel there to teach you something about the gospel message. It's, there's a single point concerning it. It's about how you get in. It's about how you prepare. It's about what you do when you get there. It's about what you will receive. It's about who gets you there. It's about, it's, uh, there's a point, right? And so you have to figure out what is the gospel message that is being said. It, it, it really will parallel the point. Whatever the point is, that's the gospel message that they're making. And then the other thing is um, that I think is really super important for all of us to know, those who want to understand it will, you will. Even though there's a lot of people who struggle with parables, uh, understanding why Jesus wrote in parables, I think clarifies for you why, why sometimes the mystery behind it. But Matthew 13, uh, 15, let's go look at that together. Um, Hold on, let me grab my book here. 1315, he says, therefore I speak to them in parables because while seeing they do not see and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Why? Because they're, they're rebelling. Remember, I just told you in that sequence of events, we're in, the, we're in the segment division in chapter 13. Do not reject your king, right? And he's saying, well, I'm speaking them to parables because they're not, basically, they're not listening. I'm speaking, they're hearing, but they're not hearing, right? I'm telling them, but they're not understanding. Why? Because they're rejecting. And so then he goes into uh, 43 at the end of chapter 13, or kind of towards the middle of it, actually. He says in 43, then the righteous will, oh, 1343. Mm, I might have gotten the wrong verse. 
he says, never mind. Okay. I, okay. Let me stop. Let, let me not confuse myself and look for that right now because I don't want to get wrapped around that. Okay. So 13, um, chapter 13 is the beginning of his third year of ministry. So he's had two years of ministry already, just so you know that. Prior to that, Jesus always spoke directly. He always spoke clearly, plainly, English. He used, he did use, um, imagery talked about sheep and bread and doors and things like that but he didn't speak in parables until this point so when you go back to 12 if you have a bible open it up to chapter 12 starting in 22 let's see if i've got this done right this is when jesus on the sabbath he's healing and he's getting all these pharisees and sadducees, sadducees very upset right uh, in verse 22, he says, then a demon possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw all the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? In other words, can he really be our king, right? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by how? Baalzebub, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will lay waste. Any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Elzebub, cast out demons, who, uh, who do your sons cast them out by? <laughs> For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Um, let me see if I want to, how far I want to go. I want to go to 37. How can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he, find, he, he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But here's the clincher, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. What does it mean there? Does anybody know what it means? Why is he saying they're committing an act of blasphemy? That's right. They're literally attributing what they're looking at the, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, and the words of the king who has come, who says, I am your king. And the signs that he performs to give evidence that he is their king, they're saying, oh, you're doing that by Beelzebub. It's a rejection of their king, which is where we're at in that segment division. And, and it's literally called blasphemy. To attribute to Satan what God is doing is an act of blasphemy. Okay, so whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Um, either make the tree good and its fruit good. This applies to what we just looked at this week in our homework, right? About how you should be seeing evidence of whether a person is of the Lord or is not. Um, the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For out of the mouth uh, speaks that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you would be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. All right, so in this, Jesus healed a demon-possessed man who was blind. They accused him of doing it by Beelzebub. This event is when Jesus condemns their refusal to hear his words and to recognize the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so from that point forward, 13, 15. Let's go over to 13, 15. Because this is just before what we looked at this whole week. I kind of wish she had given you this backdrop because I think it would have helped you a little bit better understand. But he says in 1315, for the heart of the people has become dull with their ears. They scarcely hear and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see and with their eyes they would hear that with their ears and understand with their hearts. And I would heal them. Um, he goes on then in 13. 
let's see, where did we start? We started in, um, that's where we, okay. So then it says, and Jesus presented another parable to them, but we see them, he begins in verse 18, actually talking about from that point on, it's parables. From there on, he's, and, and he was asked that question. Remember when I asked why in, in chapter 13, 10 to 17, why do you speak them in parables? He says, to you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Why? Why has it been granted to you and I to know the mysteries and to understand the parables? Why, why do you think you understand them? We want to, because <laughs> I want to. <laughs> That's exactly right. If you want to, God says, if you seek me, you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. It's not impossible. It's not too difficult. And he will open your heart and your eyes to see it and to come to understand it. Will it maybe take you some time? Yes. Will it maybe re require that you be really devoted to a little bit of time in the word and to do some research? Yes. But if you want to know the answer, God will reveal it to you. He will show it to you. We are evidence of that right here in this class every day, right? So he says, so whoever has to him, more shall be given. He will have an abundance, but whoever uh, does not have, even what he has shall be taken away. Does that sound familiar? He goes on then in these parables that we're looking at, he says exactly the same thing. The talents, remember? What, he who has some will be taken away, okay? Therefore, I speak to them in parables because, so verse 13 is something I think you should write as a cross-reference right next to where we are at, whatever your observation worksheet is. Just put on there Matthew 25, or Matthew 13, 13 rather. Why is Jesus speaking to him, to these people in parables at this point? Where are we in his ministry? We're at the beginning of his third year. He's had two years of speaking plainly and they have rejected and rejected. He finally shakes his finger at them, says, do not reject your king. And then he says here, therefore I speak to them in parables because while seeing they do not see and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Why? Because they refuse. They refuse to hear. And so therefore God begins to speak in, par in parables. But he always follows it up for us with what? interpretation is right in the text for us hallelujah all right okay so that gives you our 101 training for today it was quite a bit and I, and I apologize we have one hour left it'll be fine i always say that <laughs> that's because i you know i don't a clock means nothing to me <laughs> no it really does it's just i get so caught up there's so much good stuff what do you want me to leave out well, I mean, I'll, I'll leave something out if you want me to. <laughs> I know it's hard. And, and honestly, Kay's homework, the way it's laid out for us with five days of homework, a minimum of five hours, I know you do longer than that, most of you. Um, to scrunch that down into a one hour lesson is tough. It's, it's challenging. So I think I, I think I came up with it this week. One page. Are you proud of me? One page. Now I started out with two. This is my first one. And I went, okay, this is too crazy. This is too much. I can't do all that. I would love to though, because there's a lot of good detail. We could literally dive into every one of these parables and tear them apart and they would be a whole lesson. But we don't have the time to do that. And that's not our purpose. Our purpose is not to understand each of these parables and all their great details and all their great applications. What we are looking for is answers to specific questions. So I've written them up on the board. We wanna look at what are the events that lead up to his coming? And we're gleaning that out of these parables that are given to us because the parables are given this last segment division, remember, is about his kingdom that's coming. And when he comes, he's gonna judge. He's gonna determine who will get it, go in, right? Matthew 24, we did last week and the week before even, we saw the layout of the sequence of order of those events. So, so let's go back and review that part right now. What are the events that are gonna lead up to his coming? Matthew 24. Okay, we're right up here. Matthew 24. Uh, we, yes, and we're going to scrunch it and, and only give the major points that we have to have. We can go back 
individually and read all the extra details that we want to read privately. But for the purpose of our list making this morning, we just want to get the major things that are on there. So, because what we are trying to do right now as students is figure out our order. What literally the question is, what will happen when Jesus comes? When he literally comes back to this earth physically. Now, where does that happen on our timeline? When does Jesus physically come? The seventh bowl, right? It's all the way at the very end of all of this. So what we're looking for right now is what are the events that lead up to his coming, which means we're going to cover everything that happens from the birth things through most of that tribulation. We're going to lay that up, but we don't want to detail it. I don't want all the details, right? So what we're going to look at here is Matthew 24. The first thing we saw in Matthew in verses 4 to 8 was what? We called it what? Birth pangs. So well, the scripture calls it, calls it that, right? And in that, he goes, how does he describe those birth pangs? Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes. Now, can you tell me at what point in history do you know for sure Jesus is coming? Well, we know this is the church age, but if, the, if he's answering the question in Matthew 24, what would be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And he says, well, there's going to be birth pangs. You're going to see wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes. Does that give us any kind of a real definitive thing? No, we're in vagueville, right? We are, we are just getting kind of, and it's very interesting because he starts off by saying, don't be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you about my coming. I'm going to tell you right now, there's going to be a period called birth pangs. And in birth pangs, there are going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be famines. But he finishes it in verse six and gives us a time reference in there. And what does he say about the birth pangs? But that is not yet the end. But not yet the end. That's in verse six, okay? So then we go to the next one starting in nine and it runs to 14. And what, what does it tell us about that segment? Because it starts out with the word then, then what? Then tribulation. So he breaks it down, he says tribulation. And concerning tribulation, what kind of activities are gonna be happening? Yeah, persecution. People are going to hate one another. They're going to, yeah, they'll love. Now, how, now tell me, even with that, even what we know about, for instance, um, the, the, the seals, the breaking of the seals and the trumpets and the bowls, when we're looking at a, at a clue that he gives to us about what are going to be the signs of his coming, and he says, people's love is going to grow cold. I would say, oop, I'm in it, because boy, have people's love grown cold. So is that really a super clear indicator yet for us? Not completely, but he does mention these things, right? So he's letting you know there is a progressive uh, uh, movement towards his coming, and there are going to be these kinds of things happening. These are signs. However, they're so vague. We won't really necessarily know that there is, is going to be something that will be a trigger for us to know. But he's telling the disciples, just understand that in the birth pangs, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars. In the, when, you, when you do the tribulation part here in 9 to 14, they're going to kill you. You're going to be hated for my name's sake. Many are going to fall away. There's going to be all these things that are going to happen. But then he says, what happens that is a really big indicator for when they're going to really know for sure, those who are there to see it, what's going to happen? The whole world. And, okay, the gospel. That's right. Verse 15, the abomination of desolation. And to make it very clear, it's the one spoken by Daniel, right? And what is the location of this abomination, abomination rather? Standing in the holy place. All right. And that's okay. So 
Uh, and then what is the instruction after they see the abomination of desolation? Okay, those in Judea, flee and flee to the mountains. I'm just gonna put flee for right now. Uh, must not turn back. You need to pray that it's not in winter. Hope that you're not a nursing mom in, in those days because it's gonna make it all the more difficult, right? Okay, and then it says, what is the next time reference? There's another then. Open my book here so that I'm following along too. Okay, 21. For then there will be a great tribulation. So that starts in 21. Uh, how far does that one go? That goes all the way to 31, right? Is that correct? Oh, okay. So, okay. Actually, you're right to 28. Thank you. Okay, 21 to 28, he says, and then there will be a great tribulation. Yes, yes, I did say, yeah, I can put it up here just to make sure you catch that. Yes, and then there will be a great tribulation. The segment covers from 21 all the way to 30 uh, to 28. So then there will be a great, uh, tribulation. He describes it to us how about that time frame. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, how would you make a how would you make that comparison? Even if you were in it, how would you make that comparison? Do, have you ever been in great tribulation, even in your own life, and you feel like this is the end? <laughs> I mean, right. Right. Because we have that backdrop information. We've done the timeline out of Revelation already. Matthew doesn't give us any of that, but he's saying it's going to be this great tribulation. But what is the clincher that lets them know they're, they're flat dab in it and they are, they are really close to his coming? That abomination of desolation. That is our pivotal verse in Matthew 24. That's the one that really swings. It's like the hinges on the door. It swings things for you. You know, that's where you land. That's the hinge point. And from that point right there, everything else gets calculated to the before or to the after, right? All right. So we have abomination of desolation and then a great tribulation. And then he says, um, uh, but immediately after. So now we get to the part where what happens? The coming of the Lord. And what is our, our subject about? What will happen when he comes? So what does it say will happen? Let's, um, let's go over here to what his coming will be like in order to finish out Matthew 24. I don't really want to put it in this list because this is the events that lead up to it. But once he comes, then what's that going to be like? Let's do Matthew 24 over here again, and we're going to look at verses um, 29 to 31. Okay. What is it going to be like in that particular passage? Yes, there you go. You know what? I'm putting this in the wrong place. I want to put this in this column. I'm sorry, you guys. I got, yeah. Uh, what events surround his coming? Thank you. I should have known it was in sequential order. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Okay. Matthew 24. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys are gracious. Okay. All right. Matthew 24. Now he says, immediately. after the tribulation of those days. Now, what, what does that not mean? What does it mean? What does it not mean after the days of the tribulation? 
are we outside of the seven years? Are we outside of the seventh bowl? Are we out? So what does that mean? Well, the only way you really fully understand that is if you understand your bowls, how your bowls unfold. And what, re what uh, Revelation teaches us about where the coming is. We know the coming is when? The seventh bowl, right? So when he says at, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he really means after what? After the sixth bowl. We can add that in by, by sound interpretation because of our other work that we've done. Now, if you were just dropping into this, can you see where there would be a confusion for somebody? Yeah. <laughs> But because we've done all the work, we've laid it all out already, we know exactly when he comes, it's in the seventh bowl. We now know when it says after the tribulation of those days, it's saying everything that has come before it up to that point, but we are now in this, going to be in the seventh bowl when these things are going to be happening now. So we're going to go seventh bowl. What's going to happen? The sun will be darkened. What else? Yeah, the moon gives no light. Stars fall. There you go. Powers of heaven shaken. Okay, so that gives us, that's in verse 29. And then it says, then. Then what? And then the sign. Now that's a, yeah, what does that mean? What, what do you think it means, the sign of the Son of Man? Because I don't know. You have to tell me. Okay, he's coming on the cloud. Okay. They would come back as he had left, right? Okay. Oh. The sign of your coming and of the end of the age. But he says, so this will be the sign. The sign of the Son of Man then appears in the sky. What will be the sign? The sign is his coming. Yeah, everyone is going to see him. Apparently, well, well, look at when it, when it says the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then there's going to be this spectacular opening of, yeah, there's going to, be, have you ever all, uh, seen um, a cloud it, after the rain and how the, when the sun comes through it, you get this beautiful, not the rainbow part, but the light that comes, or in a forest, when you're walking through a forest and the sunlight comes through and you, you know, I kind of always think of it like that, but it doesn't tell us, it just says there's going to be a sign. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then now we have another then. Now we have another then that follows verse 30, the second part of it. And then what? All the tribes will what? Yeah. Oh, this is going to be really fun when we get to go and look at these cross references on this part about how, how he brings people to a place of mourning and repentance. It's, it's a really beautiful thing to, to know that this is where we're heading. And again, we've talked about this many times, but what is the purpose of this book after all is for God to bring them to this place, right? And he says, so when these things are all finished, we learned this last week, and when he has finished shattering the power of the holy people, what? Then all these things are completed, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> And okay, so the sign first, it appears, then all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn, and then what? 
they will see him. So the sign is not seeing him. There's another sign. I don't know what it is, but there's a sign. And then they're going to, now it says, the sign of the Son of Man appears, then all the tribes will mourn, then they will see him. supported by scripture and throw that out there it's always that at that moment especially for the jews they will know that the messiah will first come do you remember what we saw what we saw no intuitively oh do you remember last the last time when we were in matthew 23 i'll flip back to 23 if you should have that observation worksheet right there right Okay, and he closed out Matthew 23, where he was talking about uh, people not escaping the sentence of hell. And um, he says, because they kept, the scribes and the Pharisees kept rejecting him again, right? Then he says, how are you going to escape the sentence of hell? And he was very angry with them. You know, they were, he was denouncing the scribes and the Pharisees because they had been killing the prophets who had sent them and he knew they were about to kill him as well. So he knows this. And then he, he ends the verse there in verse 39 saying, for I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So if you tie that verse into here, these two things have to happen first. The sign appears, whatever it's going to be, all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. They're going to come to a place of repentance. Then they're going to see the Son of Man. And then it'll be just as he said here in, in 2339. Then from then on, they will, they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When he made his triumphal entry, they hailed him as king. But immediately did a turnabout and crucified him. The whole crowd stood there and shook their fists and said, crucify him. Release, was it Barabbas, right? Okay. That's not what this, this sequence shows to us, but I think what happens, uh, there has to be, we're going to see when we go to our cross references, I think Isaiah and Zechariah and so forth, it's going to talk about it, but when he comes, he literally comes pouring out his spirit on the house of David. So there has to be a personal turning for salvation first, then he comes. Because he, he will not be seen by them until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They have to come to that come to Jesus moment before Jesus comes to meet them. Because they won't, but they won't see him and then start to mourn. They will mourn and then they will see him. Repent, right. They will come to repentance first. What will have brought them to repentance? All of these, all of these seven years of tribulation. So he has to go through this pro, through this process, and he say he said before again, it's the um, humbling of the holy. What did I just? I just quoted it to you a second ago. The shattering of the holy people, right? The shattering of the holy people. So he shatters them through this, this process, they, they go to their knees and they bow. And it says they will see the sign of the man, the, of, the, of the son of the man appearing in the sky. That one, I'm still a little vague on what I understand it to mean. We could probably Google and look at commentaries, but again, they're commentaries. Um, it'd be nice if we could kind of 
figure out kind of, kind of like where I found the gap, the gap, the gap last week. That was so cool. There it was. It, the gap is actually stated. It just doesn't call it the gap. And it doesn't say this is the church age, but it is the church age, right? And it says about these birth pangs, there's going to be wars and rumors of war. And then in Daniel uh, 9, I think it's in 26, it does the same thing. It talks about, and then there will be desolations to the end. There will be wars and desolations to the end. Again, the gap is mentioned after the 69 weeks are completed. There is a gap reference without it being clearly stated, the church age. It, but it's there as soon as you notice it, you go, oh, wow, there it is, right? Okay, so we, we, we know that sometimes God makes these subtleties. This thing about the uh, sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky, I'm still waiting for God to show me that subtle place. It's there somewhere. I'm going to find it that is going to explain to me exactly what does he mean by that. But what we do know is everything that precedes it. We know that there's going to be all these things happening in the heavens. Because we've studied Revelation, we know all the things that will have happened before. But what's interesting to me is think about all the things that have happened before. Seals, trumpets, we're now in the sixth bowl. Horrible things. And now something is going to happen that it's going to catch their attention. <laughs> It's going to have to be pretty wow, whatever it is, right? Wouldn't you think? Because the, the world is going to be turned upside down. Every hill and, and mountain moved out of its place. Every island moved. Um, the, the mountains made plains. It, it's going to be interesting. There's, waters are going to be bitter. The skies are going to fall. We now know that the sun, the moon is going to be dark and the stars are going to fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. It's going to be crazy. A lot of things going on. And yet when the sign of the son of man appears, it catches their attention. Yes, I do think so. Yes. All the tribes of the earth will see him and will mourn. Oh, well, oh. T tell me the chapter verse you're in. Are we in Matthew or Revelation? Okay, I, I changed my page. That's why I was asking. I know. Okay, thank you. Okay. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the sun coming. Uh, Oh, good question. Yes. Can you give us an answer? So Robert. Look at the Lord's sign <laughs> yes. In the Greek. Yes. G 4592, sign they him. And it is a mark, a token, a sign by which a person or thing is distinguished from all others. Right. Exactly. It typically uh, portends an unusual occurrence transcending the common course of nature. So in other Interesting. Words, something that can't happen any other way. That it it um, it portends a remarkable event that is soon to happen, miracles and wonders by which God authenticates men sent by Him or by which men prove that their cause is pleading God's cause. Cool. When you look at where else it's used in the New Testament, it's it's always the signs and wonders, the sign. Well, look at we have three signs in the Book of Revelation: the woman, the dragon, and then the angels of the seventh trumpet too. So those are also signs, and there's. They're profound in, the, in who they are and what part they will play in the unfolding of Revelation. It's not necessarily the event that it is, it is a marker that this event is coming. Right, right. That was my point. And that was why I was bringing it up. Because whatever this sign is, it's going to supersede all these other crazy things that are already going on. I'm just bringing that up to say... I mean, it doesn't really explain to us in detail about that, but I would love to figure that one out. One day, maybe we will. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, Peter? Ooh. Maybe. 
Yeah. So now we're guessing, but yes. And I want a verse, <laughs> but yes, absolutely. I love that. I love that. Okay. It, this is the fun part. I think about doing a Bible study like this too, is there are still going to be some things left out there that we're not totally hammered down tightly, but I, you know, just like some of the things I've discovered doing it this time round, I'm learning new things every time and new things are starting to make themselves evident to me, the more I do it. And that is that's why they call it the living word of God. It is living, breathing word. And every single time you open it, you get new insights and, and you will never stop learning. It, it is going to be a journey. And there may be a time when I have to come back and say, oops, I taught that one wrong, right? I might. And you know, fortunately, God has been so gracious to me through the years that on the whole, as long as you stick with your inductive, inductive proce processes, you, you do land pretty close and pretty safe. We don't go into heresy. We might get a misunderstanding about a specific point, but we don't commit acts of heresy against God's word. We don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit, right? We don't do what the Pharisees and scribes were doing in the book of Matthew as they were rejecting his signs and his words. Yes, exactly. We do see dimly. Some of you more than others. I, on the other hand, have got new cataracts, so <laughs> my eyes don't see dimly anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but yes, my mind's eye is very dim sometimes. Okay, now let's talk about who he's talking about then in this. What is going to happen when he comes? All these verses that we have looked at, Matthew 13, 24, 25, Thessalonians, and also our um, uh, Revelation, of course, also. Um, Daniel is another one we've looked at. So when you consider all of those what did we, was it last week or the week before that we, I, I took you to say, let's nail that down exactly who is this time frame for? What is our default going to be when we say, who is he talking to? The Jews. Thank you, Daniel 9. Good job. Okay, so let's start there. Our default is always to go back to Daniel 9.24. Because what we had last week was we took this, this a statement here about the abomination of desolation and we connected it to here because it says spoken of by Daniel, right? And we connected that. So then we went to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, where this prophecy is given. It's a decreed prophecy and it's concerning whom in the very first verse. Yeah. It, exactly. He says, this is decreed for Daniel and his people. Or, or actually, it's not that way. It's Daniel's people. Daniel's people and his holy city. Now, once we have that, that's verse 24, right? Now, once we have that then, because who is Daniel? Who's his, who's his holy city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And who are his people? The Jews. So now we know we're talking about Israel, the nation, right? And its capital. So who, who is the major target of everything that we are observing as we are looking at things that pertain to the end time? The end time, in order to stop fighting against yourself with, is this the Christians? Is this the, we talked a little bit last week. I said to you, God's target audience, God's target agenda in the accomplishing of the 70th week that's yet still hanging out there, that's not been fulfilled, is to do right here what he has said, this decree for Daniel and his people. We are waiting for that last one week. So when you look at anything, it talks about the end time is speaking of that one week, specifically when it's talking about all the the turmoil that leads up to him establishing his kingdom, that one week is decreed for Daniel and his, 
and his people. And it's for the purpose of shattering their power, their power of resistance, their rebellion against God, their rejection of Jesus as their king. Why did they say shattering of the holy people? They're not very holy. No, they're not, but they are called God's holy people. Yeah, well, and because God really wanted them to be, he decreed them to be. Right, separated, set apart. Yeah, holy doesn't necessarily mean saved in this context. In the context here, he's saying these are my people because why? He made a covenant, right? So what, what was the covenant? Who was the covenant initially made with? Abraham. And he told Abraham, I will give you what? land a seed and a nation right and who is the seed according to galatians 3 16 it's jesus it's christ right and that and that seed is christ so he promised him that but then he made another covenant we call the davidic covenant right and what did he promise through the davidic covenant you that's right you will you will always have a a a king upon the throne and so through that covenant promise he says i am going to bring a king for you which is why matthew the whole book of matthew is about i'm your king i'm your king i'm your king and in the place we're at here don't reject me and i'm coming and when i come i judge and what i judge is i judge who gets to come in because i'm king right and that's what the parables we looked at are we gonna have time yes we'll have time okay we're almost getting through this part Okay, for God's people and his holy city. Well, that's true, Carol. Did you hear what she just said? She pointed out a good, a good thing we just missed. It's for your people and your holy city. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, I lost my marker. Here it is. Okay another one here that's gonna write better okay so let's go ahead and talk then a little bit more about this we know then from dan we really could stop right there because that's sufficient right daniel we know that about this decreed 70 weeks right 70 weeks and uh, 69 weeks are fulfilled We looked at all that the last few weeks. So what we now know is one week is future. Um, and we see, we see the fulfillment of this, it, that, that time frame, that 69 weeks that were fulfilled ended, we saw that in Luke 19 with Jesus's triumphal entry. That's Luke 19, uh, 28 to 44. If you want to look at that, this one starts in 445 BC with the decree of Artaxerxes to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem. That's what that whole de um, uh, decree is right here, that covenant. All right. The focus then is this period of time. It is a decree for the Jews, right? A decree for the Jews. or I should say Jewish nation specifically, right? Because what he's fulfilling here now is God's promised a land, a seed, and a nation. The seed is Christ. In the new covenant that Christ initiated, anyone can come into faith. Anyone can have salvation. We get grafted in, right? But there's a part of that promise also he made to Abraham uh, back in Genesis 15, which was about a land. And they were to be a people who were going to be literally physically living on that land. And then he would be their, their God and they would be his people. And that has not happened yet. So we're waiting for that. Um, but it does not mean there won't be other people there besides the Jews. Even though this is his target, we are, what, I'm, what we are not saying is that no one else gets in, that no one else gets saved, that no one else is being paid attention to by God. Remember, there are two witnesses. There are the 144,000. They are witnessing those first three and a half years. We have uh, the gospel, the eternal gospel given by the angels. That's all spread out before us in chapter 14 of Revelation. 
And then at the end, the last half of that Revelation 14, it talks about the reaping. So there's going to be a reaping, but there are going to be some who are reaped by angels and what's going to happen to them. They go into the wrath of God. They get, they get judged at the end, right? So there's, there is opportunity for everyone. Every man has opportunity. But what is God's mission for, for the 70th week? Israel. That's what he's accomplishing. He's fulfilling his word, his promise to them. Why do you think that's so important? It's a covenant. It's a covenant. And if he breaks it, then he's not God. Yeah, if he breaks his word, then he's not God. Um, remember one of the things he kept saying in Ezekiel, I'm doing this not for your sake, O Israel, because you have defiled my name, but I am doing this for my holy name to vindicate my holy name. And to and therefore, and then the world will know that I am God, because I fulfill my words, I keep my promises, I do exactly as I've said. Israel has, you know, dissipated into the into the nations for all these thousands of you know, these two thousand or so years. Now he's beginning to put them back on the land, and we're all going whoa, right? But wait until he actually really brings it about. Wait till that glorious day when the kingdom is on the earth and we get to physically see it. And God's word is right before our eyes. We get to see that he has done as he's promised. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so now let's look on what will be his coming like then. Well, when do we learn? This is like 33 to 44 of Matthew. And we're going to hit Matthew 13 also. Okay. What do, we, what do we know about when? What will be the, his coming be like? Well, what is it? we get a parable. This is our first opportunity to talk about parables. We looked at parables, right? Uh, in Matthew 24, we see one about... Um, yeah. Okay. What, and what did we learn there? Let me get my... I'm in Matthew 24. We're looking at 32. Yeah, we start out with a fig tree, an illustrative story, right? This was the fig tree. He says, this is how you're going to know about the wind of it. And he says, there's going to, it's going to be like a, a, a fig tree when it begins to bloom. What do you know when it begins to bloom? The summer is almost here. So it's the sign that tells you that Jesus is near his imminent return is is about to be upon you uh the signs of four to eight are vague right mm -hmm. so we're looking for something on that fig tree that's more decisive what did we determined it really is abomination. the abomination of desolation um now the question will be uh will you and i be here to see this well the audience he's speaking to are the jews and it's going to be the Jews who are living at that time when that abomination occurs. So that does not answer the question for us clearly, right? Um, many of us are praying we are out of here before all this. Um, and, but then there are others who believe it's mid-trip. And so because the, he literally tells us what? What will be the sign of his coming? Well, he says no one is what? No one knows. The day or the hour. There you go. It will be like the days of Noah. And in that, that it says they won't understand until it happens. Until uh, it comes upon them. Uh, and then it tells us what's going to happen. This is interesting. One will be taken and one will be left. Now, the question is, who's the one that's taken and who's the one that is left, right? Would, in, 
Are you one taken or are you one left? Well, can you tie it to the parable of the tears? Thank you. Yes, you certainly can. Let's go back. Actually, we can start. We can, yes, we can actually go to 31 to 46 and start with those sheep first in chapter 25. Let's go to 25, because after 24, then we start doing these parables that we looked at, right? There was the virgins for one thing. There was the parable of the, of the uh, faithful slaves. And then we get to 31 and we get what kind of a, of a piece of literary work when you hit 31. Is this still parables? No. Very good. I am proud that you guys picked up on that. We are no longer in a parable. We did two parables. Now starting in 31, we are in a historical record. He's giving us factual record of exactly what is going to happen. And he says that when he comes, now he does use an imagery that he's going to be, he's going to be like a shepherd in the things that he's doing, but that's not a parable. He just simply uses the metaphor or the imagery so that you can, can relate to who, what it's going to be like for us uh, at that time. So he says in uh, Matthew 25, this is 31 to 46. When Jesus comes, what will he do? First thing he's going to do is what? He well, before that, what does he do concerning his throne? He yeah, he will sit on his throne. That's in 31. Okay. Then he says he's going to gather something. What will he do? gather? He gather all the nations. That's in 32. And then what is what will he do? He separates. Okay, is that mean because he's not changing your, your pronoun there? It's going back to the word nations and not individuals. Yep. Okay. Yes, and this is what's all also very interesting is because remember throughout how in the Old Testament, when you read the, particularly the minor prophets, how often God talks about the judgment of the nations? Mm -hmm. Not only is there judgment for the individual lives and for our own personal salvation, but he judges nations. And just like he judged Israel as a nation, casting them off their land for a long period of time, now he's going to bring them back in order to reveal to the world that I am God and I do what I say, right? My promises are true. Um, but he's also going to judge nations. Now, we saw in Daniel 7, when it talked about, um, about with the with the beast and all of his cohorts, right? The, the horns, rather, the horns and the other horns. And it says at the end, one of there, it says, but a, an, a, an extension of life is granted to some of them. So who are the some of those? Well, what did those horns represent? Kings of nations, right? They're nations and kings. So he's saying about those nations, there's going to be a, 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 an extension of life granted to some of them when Jesus returns. When he comes back, he's not going to come back and wipe out the whole world and there's only going to be Israel as a nation. There are going to be many nations. As a matter of fact, we read when we did our the last part of the book of Revelation when we went into 21 and 22 that it says the nations will come. So there are going to be nations even in eternity. But of course, they'll be redeemed nations. They'll be nations of only believers, especially in, when you go into the new heaven, the new earth, only believers. But while in the millennial kingdom, he's going to grant an extension of life to the nations that are on the earth. Who do you think he's going to grant an extension of life to? Who would get that grace? Mm -hmm. Okay. Who are the nations he's absolutely going to wipe out and destroy in the moment he comes? The what? And the ones who are where? Okay. Well, that's that's at the end. Before. There you go. Yeah. The ones, remember, they're going to gather in the sixth bowl for heart Megiddon, right? And it's going to be the kings of the east and others. And they're all going to come down the, from the Euphrates River and they're going to come against Israel. And then it talks in 19 about him slaying all these men. He's going to also slay the 
uh, the dragon and the false prophet put him into uh, the lake of fire. He, and he also uh, casts Satan into a pit for a thousand years. Then he has his reign. But when he comes in that seventh bowl, he goes to war, but at, and he destroys all those who are there and coming against him. But there's an extension of life granted to some and so there you have nations that will still and why do you think he does that i can see carol's really puzzled by this nations why do you, well the nations are actually composed of individuals why would those nations and those individuals get a free pass they're not going to get a free pass okay they're, they're okay going to be judged just like everybody else right but they have this opportunity to bow the knee and have we seen anything in our homework this week that kind of alludes to what he might be doing? Um, it seems like I remember, hold on. The nations are gonna be gathered. Um, I, one of the things you have to remember is we only looked at a few parables and there's a bunch of them. And the parables were only written in the last year of his ministry, because that's when he began speaking in parables. The first two years he spoke plainly. So you can go to every one of those parables and know that probably he's speaking mostly about those end times and the things that are going to happen when he, when, when he comes in his glory. Either, and I don't know if any of them make reference to the catching up of the bride or any of that kind of thing. I, I don't think they do, or we would have been talking about them a long time ago, but, but they will talk about what God's going to do in those end days in that last seven years. And when he comes to be king, we see the virgins, for instance, he comes for his bride there. That is one. So when he comes for his bride, what does it say there? Remember, it is a parable though. So we can't do a tit for tat and say that that's speaking of the church he's just, giving you two kinds of he's just giving you people groups and he's giving a demonstration through a bride okay it doesn't mean it's speaking of the bride of christ it doesn't mean it's speaking of the church it's speaking about a bride as a demonstration to teach a point right all right so as tradition jewish tradition and the wedding is that the bride goes home after her betrothal and and waits can you imagine how wrinkled that wedding gown will be at the end of a year? She must iron it every night. <laughs> yeah, air it out or something. Um, okay, so so I think that's a really good thing, point to bring out because automatically, because we're Gentiles, we live in the New Testament, our knee jerk uh, default is everything's about us, the church. <laughs> But when God is speaking to Israel about his second coming, he's talking about a definitive time in history. He's talking about these seven years. We call them tribulation. Also call them Daniel's 70th week. So everything that we are looking at in these things that we are looking at right here, he's literally, if you do your Matthew at a glance chart and look in there, he's speaking to them here in 24 and 25 about the fact that when he comes to be their king, Israel's king, he's gonna come and he's gonna judge who gets to come in, who gets to stay and who goes. So he's, he's exerting his authority and proclaiming it as absolute authority and power, but also he's giving them a warning in it that you better be prepared because I'm gonna come judging, right? very good nice job kathy did you uh, did y'all catch that she's saying um the, the ones who when jesus is speaking about 
you know, he's praising the slaves that they had fed him, they had visited him in prison and so forth. And she's saying, so is that talking about in that day of the tribulation, those who treated Israel good? And the answer is yes. Now, does it mean you also need to be doing good to all people? Of course, whether they're Jews or they're not Jews, but specifically the litmus tests on whether or not you love God and understand uh, and, sub and bow your knee to his plan and his program is how you treat Israel. And he says, when I come, will I find you being faithful and sensible, right? Will I find you being uh, uh, responsible in the duties I left you to do? So with the bride, the virgins, he tells them you are to be prudent, prepared, you're to be ready, you're to be on the alert. So that's the message of that parable. It's all about being ready. So what is, how does that work out in your life? What, what do you think that means for you today? Be ready. That's, that's a redundant statement. What do you mean be ready? How are you being ready? Well, I would declare you're being ready right now by what you're doing right here. You're preparing your hearts and minds to understand God's agenda, God's plan. You're on board with it. You're seeking to love him. You're, you've not left your first love, as he says in the beginning of Revelation. So uh, yesterday at church, the, uh, the pastor was talking about the value of each individual in the body of Christ and how we all have a spiritual gift. We just did spiritual gifts. We talked about this. The baseball team does not run just with the pitcher. You know, he's a, he's, he, he's a little bit of a star. He's like the pastor. He kind of gets a little bit of a, a grandiose attention sometimes, but you, he cannot pitch he can't win a, uh, a a game without everyone else on the team doing their part right and so when he's talking here about the one who's being ready are you working in a manner of the talents the parable of the talents right which follows the virgins of being ready he's saying now what are you doing with the being ready in the being ready are you exercising your spiritual gifts i gave every one of you a spiritual gift i don't know i don't know what all of your gifts are you all know what mine is right okay maybe <laughs> i hope <laughs> what did you say oh 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 robert i tell you <laughs> but if we are being prudent as as the is what is being challenged here in this for these women these virgins that in their being prudent being attentive to paying attention having done the work and also not just being ready as in having done the work but are you looking up are are your eyes gazing toward heaven every day i can't tell you there is not a day for me that goes by that that particularly my friend celeste and i talk on text and phone and whatever oh, i wish jesus would come today <laughs> i mean really we talk about it every day every time we talk we talk about today hope lord today that is the 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 expectation that god wants for us that i think is also what he's speaking about with these virgins being ready yeah having done everything you can in particular the the most essential one is what the oil having the oil what do you think that might be symbolic of the Holy Spirit, having relationship with God, having not left that first love. So there's, there's a little bit of, of expansion that you can go into with your mind on how you interpret all the little nuances of the, of the, of the parable. But the end result, the main message, be ready, be prepared, so that when he comes, you are boom, up, and you're glad. You're not going to get there and go, oh, I should have. Right? I know. We're almost there. We're good. Okay. <laughs> she thinks we're not done. <laughs> we're doing really well, I think. We've got 10 minutes. Okay. So then the talents, it's talking about the good and faithful slaves and who is going to enter, right? And he de deems some of them are wicked. Why? What did God give to them? Did God give them anything? He gave them a talent, right? And what did he do with his talent? He buried it. He sat on it. He hid it. He, he dug a hole and stuck it in there. But to me, the most profound tell in all of this is 
how he viewed his master. Did that blow your mind? How do you view, how do you view your master is a tell just like, Loving Israel and doing good towards Israel is a tell about your heart toward God. Are you submissive to understanding his work in Israel and why they're significantly important? Why we should be supporting them as a nation and a people? Why we should be praying for them? Because it's spiritual warfare in the heavenly realms between Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels. This is God's agenda and Satan wanting to stop it right? So we should be praying for Israel every single day and be on their side, even though they are yet in their rebellion, because God has an agenda for them. And we need to understand, we do understand it, having done what we've done here. We, we know God's goal is to do what? What's the goal? To save all Israel, to put them back on their land and and for him to be their God, as he said. I lost my train of thought. Okay, let's move on. Okay, this is this one I do want to do. So one will be taken, one will be left. Uh, let's talk about the uh, in uh, 25, Matthew 25. Um, it's 31 to 36. It's the same area as this. At the end of it, it says, who enters? The blessed, right? The blessed, it says, what about them? What happens? They what? They inherit the kingdom, right? Okay, they inherit the kingdom. That's in verse 46, uh, 34, okay? The blessed inherit, but what about the opposite? The, the accursed. Uh-huh. The first word it says, they depart. Did you notice that? They depart into eternal fire, verse 41. What is, and in 46, what? They go away. Away in 46, right. But the righteous to eternal life. Okay, so does just looking at this one help you understand who's taken and who's left? They inherit because they are left. The accursed are going to depart. They will be taken, accursed. The ones that are going to be left will receive the kingdom. And if that's not enough, let's look at another one. Matthew 13. Thank you. Okay, good job. Matthew 13. What does it say about the sons of the evil one? What will happen to them? <laughs> they are gathered and they go to that place to a uh, place of gnashing and weeping of teeth or te gnashing of teeth and whatever weeping yeah the, there you go weeping and gnashing <laughs> i'll get it weepy <laughs> and gnashing That's in 41 of 13. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then in 43 of 13, what does it say about the righteous? Will shine in kingdom. And I'm gonna put that's in verse 43. This one was in 41. Okay, so again, Matthew 13, another parable, and at the end of it, what we see are the evil, they are gathered, and they go to a place of weeping. The righteous, they go into the kingdom. They are the ones who, that are going to be left. They, 
You know, we used to think being left behind was a bad thing. In this case, at the end of the age, because we're talking about this time frame here, not the rapture of the church, we are talking about at the end of the age, when Jesus comes, the ones that depart are the ones who are the accursed. But the ones who stay, the, the ones that are left behind, are the ones who enter into the kingdom. That's right. Because it's the beginning of the thousand year reign. So this is not talking about the rapture. This is talking about when Jesus comes at the seventh bowl, he makes the decision. He separates the sheep from the boat, the goats, the goats go into eternal uh, damnation and the sheep enter into the kingdom for a while, for a while, short while, probably. But yeah. Okay. So what is our message for now then? Grand finale. We're all done. Matthew 24. What is our, our message then for you and me? Because this all pertains to these people here. This pertains to Israel. It pertains to the people who are going to be around in that 70th week. But you know where we are? We're in the age of the church. We're in that gap time. We're in the birth pains up here. This is the church age. And what are we what is the message for us though if these parables are telling them to be ready for that coming we have a coming too don't we we have a coming it's called the rapture we're not sure when it is either are we it's basically the same concept it may not be that he is specifically talking about the church here he isn't he's talking about the end of the age and the, the seventh bowl but the principle is still the same there's going to be a coming for the church as well and we don't know the day or the hour mm -hmm. right i mean not totally i mean we well we because we don't want to uh be dogmatic but we can each come to our own decision of when we think it's going to happen but even if you think you know when it's going to happen do you really know the day or the hour no, you are never going to know the day or the hour. Even if you have a place on the timeline that you have designated it, you still don't know really the day nor the hour. And personally, I think that if you, once you see a coalition of kings come together and a covenant made with Israel, you will know the day and the hour. So for me, that's a very good indicator that we will probably not be here for it. But that aside, we still don't know the day or the hour. So what are we to be doing that we see demonstrated for us through these parables? What are we to be doing? Be, yep. Be on the alert. Uh, what was, what, what about, uh, see to that no one deceives you. That's in 20, uh, 24, four, uh, be on the alert. That was also, that was in 42. I think that's right. 42. Okay. Be ready. 44. See, this was a short list. Be faithful, right? Uh -huh, so you gave translation. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be faithful, sis, but yes, it's fine. <laughs> there you go. At his coming, and that this would be for the church. I'm going to put that on here. That's you and I. For the church, be found uh doing what your master has entrusted you to do he's entrusted you with talents he's entrusted you he, actually he gave you your wedding gown already it's on it's your it's that wedding gown that's not the works of the righteous but the but the the gown which says or your suit you. you're welcome robert <laughs> he wants he wants a tax a white text for the guys, but it doesn't say that. It says wedding gowns. So sorry. But anyway, you get your wedding attire. How about we put it that way? You get your wedding attire and it's given to you a justification. At the day that you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, he seals you until the day of redemption. And having that part being ready, that's the first step of being ready. Now be ready doing what God has entrusted you with, which is what? I don't know what 
what has tell me what has God entrusted you to do? Using my gifts that God has given. And me. what are your gifts? Um, I work with the children at, in church. Good. Okay. So serving, teaching, um, mercy. Yes. Okay. Oh, she's a mercy girl. I could tell. Yes, she does. Administer, I need you desperately. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I need so many. I actually, you all keep me on track. I really do appreciate all of you because all of you contribute. And this class cannot run without every one of you in here and helping. If you don't do your homework, there's not even a conversation to be had, right? What is your gift, Sarah? What has God entrusted you to do while you're here on this earth? Teaching, maybe? Awesome. All right, Kathy. I'm teaching admin both, and I'm helping my mother-in-law with a surgery. I can't believe you didn't say mercy right off the bat, because, really? yeah. I, I feel like, this, this is my opinion, but I feel like God develops each of those gifts in us to a certain capacity. We definitely have our strong suits, but that doesn't right. mean what motivates you yeah what motivates you you're absolutely right about that kathy we're getting a one-on-one on spiritual gifts i wish i had i wish i had time i want to go through the whole i won't put the rest of you on the spot but really this is what it says be found doing what he's entrusted you with be found doing what he has entrusted you Because I'm making an application now, certainly they are going to, he wants them to do the same thing, but all I'm doing is taking it to us, the church, because obviously everything that we are learning is to prepare us with a better understanding of what's coming ahead. I love knowing the end from the beginning. I'm so glad God did that for us. Um, I operate better if I know what's ahead. You know, I, I'm not a, I fly by the seat of my pants girl. I like an agenda and a plan. I don't really like big, pack your suitcase. You don't know where you're going. I, no, not for me. <laughs> I need to know what to pack. <laughs> but God also wants us to take this information and make a personal application. And particularly when we get to this point right here, that's why I titled it. What is our message for now? That's why I titled it that way. Because for what is our message for now? They also are told in that day, these people living at that time, they are to be on the alert. They are to be ready. They are to be faithful and sen sensible slaves. He is speaking to the end time people. He's speaking to those who will be there when they see the abomination of desolation. So all these exhortations in Matthew 24 are for them as well at that time in history. If they've come into faith, they're going to go into God's word. They're going to see this and God is going to say, just be faithful. Just hang on. As a matter of fact, you remember one of the things he, he talks about, um, those two pivotal verses where it says the gospel is going to be preached and people are going to be saved. Therefore, when you see the abomination, flee. Preserve your life if you can. Now, if you can't, God has got that also. He's sovereign over that. But understand he's going to be presenting the gospel all the way to the end and people are going to be being saved. So when the abomination happens, if you're one of those who have been saved or you're on the verge of looking like you're heading that way and you know these things, you obey me and you flee. He's giving them instruction, flee. And then he, those people too, be on the alert, be faithful, be found doing all these things. But I wanted to bring this to us because we have a coming too, not the, the second coming in the seventh bowl. That's not our coming. Our coming is a rapture that he, where he has promised that he's going to catch us out of these things. He's going to, he's going to, I'm losing everything here. Anyway, he's going to um, rescue us. He says in the, in the opening, in the opening letters of revelation, he tells us that we are not going to endure that. He is going to rescue us out of that. But we have to know that our coming is exactly the same way as theirs. We too need to be on the alert. We need to be ready. We need to make sure, make an assurance of your salvation. Do you really know the Lord? Are you truly empowered by the spirit? Has he, has he fallen upon you and washed you clean? And are you walking with him? And, and if you are, then be faithful and sensible slaves. 
be about the business of your father's work, the master's work, doing what he's entrusted you with. You have a talent, whatever it is, your God-given spiritual gifts are given to you. And all of the things that you own, your house, your cars, your, your money, everything belongs to God. Use it for his glory while you're awaiting on this earth for the day when he comes. Amen. That was a good sermon. Thank you, guys. It was a great time.